Hello, I am Stephanie Jones. I work at the University of Southampton in the English department. And for this Friday lunchtime talk uh, for, the, for the brilliant cultural initiative that is God's House Tower, um, I'm going to speak about women writers and the sea. So in this talk, um, I want to, I have really three ambitions for this talk. I want to introduce some writers you may not have heard about before. I want to offer a sense of the very diverse ways in which women have written about the sea. And thirdly, I, I want to provide some starting points for understanding the importance of this writing. So women's imaginative writing about the sea has been really critically significant to how we think about ecology, to how we frame history, to how we construct gender and think about sexuality, to how we conceive beauty um, and to how we might become politically aware and politically active. So women's watery writing has provided insight and inspiration into all these areas of life and, and more. I'm not aiming today for any kind of historical coverage. Um, I'm not going to propose a sort of genealogy of women writing about the sea. Rather, I'm going to take a, a case studies approach and I'm going to talk about just five authors, five very different imaginative works uh, written in English. I've chosen a, a nature writer, a film director, a novelist, a theorist and a poet in the hope that I might appeal to all kinds of reading tastes. So the first of my five authors is the mid 20th century American writer Rachel Carson. So in any historiography of the current environmental movement, you will find reference to Rachel Carson's 1962 book, Silent Spring. This is a book about the danger of pesticides. It's a very powerful polemical piece of research um, that had immediate and very lasting political effect. It is one of the accepted foundational texts of modern environmental activism. Uh, so, so Silent Spring is often studied for its uh, role in launching modern environmentalism. Um, and as such, it is now the book for which Rachel Carson is most widely known. But Carson mostly wrote about the sea. She was a marine biologist with a poetic sense of the world. And this combination of scientific knowledge and imaginative sense allowed her to write with extraordinary power. She had a gift for reaching a wide audience with her observations on the natural world. So she was on the bestseller list um, for her 1941 um, uh, book, The Sea Around Us. Um, and she still appears on those, those lists of, you know, the, the 100 books that one should read before one dies. She, she's got that kind of status. So Carson's work on the ocean are now established as important works of literature, not just sort of historically significant work, um, works in the promotion of an understanding of marine worlds to a wider public audience, but as works that have a, have a kind of literary quality in their own right. So how might we identify in more detail what makes her writing so powerful? So, Carson refuses to equate reality with fact. Reality is not just a set of facts. For Rachel Carson, the real world, reality, is a way of knowing. And a sense of wonder is very important, absolutely crucial to this way of knowing. So the real world around us, to use her phrase, can only be understood, can only be really fully felt if we approach it with wonder. Um, and this word wonder is, is very important in her work. Um, it's been sort of much thought about by those who, who read and research her work. And it captures the kind of secular religiosity, perhaps is one way of putting it, in her approach to the natural world. So another aspect of her work that I think uh, really makes it very powerful is her very poetic uh, sense 
of the relationship between the very smallest creatures and the largest weather patterns. So the way in which she tells natural history um, and talks about the natural world moves uh, constantly, not quickly, but constantly uh, between a tiny uh, 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 an observation of something very small, a, a tiny crab or a shell, um, and connects that up um, in very sort of beautiful ways to the to the largest weather patterns and the biggest kind of movements of the ocean and the world. So she takes us, you know, smoothly from you know, a, a passage about the formation of a coral. Uh, to a comment on the effects of melting glaciers. She really sort of brings these together in a way that creates poetry. Uh, something that I particularly admire about Rachel Carson's work, and I think is a, a, a particularly beautiful achievement of her writing, is the way in which she manages to draw you completely into her point of view. So this is not a marine biologist, this is not a scientist who is uh, taking on some performative pretense of absolute objectivity. She often speaks from the first person and from her own point of view. And yet at the same time, she's very self-effacing. So while she takes you completely into the moment and what it is she's looking at, she also manages to centre ecology and to um, take away the sense that we are living in a uh, human-centred, anthropocentric world. Um, and I think this is very beautifully done. Um, some scholars have valued this as a particularly feminine quality in her work. It's, it's sort of talked about as something that is feminine and feminist in her work. Um, and I think that that, that can be um, a route into really valuing uh, this balance she achieves between subjectivity and self-effacement. So the final thing I want to kind of draw out about Carson's writing that I think is um, particularly beautiful, particularly powerful, is the very complex sense of time that she manages to convey through her writing about the sea um, around us. <clears throat> so she works very much uh, with a tenor, a register of memory and remembering. She might start a passage where she speaks about remembering walking down to a particular coastline that will then you know, segue in, into some observation of exactly what is going on at that moment and compare it to a few seasons before. Uh, so human time is important uh, within her writing. But she's also very alert to and constantly invoking uh, seasonal time, tidal time, this sort of circular sense of uh, returning with difference um, that the sea uh, can really make felt and that her writing about the sea really makes felt. But she's also hugely alert to what we think about now or what is sometimes talked about now as deep time or geological time, a time that to which the human lifespan and human history is somehow and in some ways irrelevant. Um, so she is constantly pushing her reader to try to grasp a pre-human or a more than human sense of temporality, a uh, sense of the, the scale of things, the scale of, scale of the world. I mean, there's a kind of uh, irony uh, to this um, at certain moments in her writing. Uh, so Carson was very aware of and very interested in the uh, long prehistory and history of sea level rise. And she notices in the mid 20th century uh, that we are experiencing a period of rising sea levels. But uh, she was writing at a time in the 1940s and 1950s when there was not the depth and breadth of scientific evidence available um, for her to even think that this could be attributed to anything other than natural causes. Uh, so she writes of sea level rise as part of this non-human 
sense of time uh, and, and doesn't connect it as we do today uh, to the actions of humans and humanity. So uh, what I mean by there being a certain irony to this is here we have Rachel Carson as one of the founding figures of modern environmentalism, modern environmental activism, uh, but in her work in the 1950s, uh, we're not yet at a point where she realises uh, that sea level rise is the result of human action and is uh, anthropogenic in its causes. So Rachel Carson is not only an important scientific scholar of the global ocean, she is also a very lyrical writer about the sea. Um, this combination of science and poetry that we find in her writing is very powerful. So if you're a fan of the popular current of new nature writing, uh, so Jean Spracklin, Philip Hoare, Robert McFarlane, uh, a few of the well-known authors who are currently uh, contributing to this genre of writing, then uh, do seek out Rachel Carson's books about the sea. Uh, they're, they're very beautiful. Okay, so the next writer I want to talk about is Jane Campion. My next case study, as it were, is this New Zealand film writer and director. Uh, she's perhaps most recently famous for the TV series Top of the Lake, but back in 1993, her film The Piano was what first really brought her to global attention and to global critical acclaim. Uh, certainly in 1993 in Australia, it was hard to go anywhere shopping malls, cafes, without hearing the piano music from this film, which was composed by Michael Nyman. Um, and if you Google the music to this film, film you may uh, discover that you've heard it somewhere, sometime, that you, you know it's watery repetitions without knowing how you know. So this film draws upon the sea and water in some really fascinating ways that tell us a lot about Campion as a, a unique storyteller. But the film also, I think, exemplifies some of the ways that women have drawn upon the histories and the material qualities of the sea to express female experiences in ways that are liberating and thought provoking, um, but perhaps also a bit troubling. So Campion's film is set in the mid 19th century in the area around Nelson, which you will see at the north end of the South Island of New Zealand. It tells the story of Ada, a mute Scottish woman who's sent by her family to New Zealand in order to marry an English settler. So the central plot focuses on Ada's unhappy forced marriage um, and the story of her falling in love with another man, another British settler. So the film addresses a history of women being treated as commodities, of women being treated as objects of exchange. And the film also addresses the violence of colonial history and the disenfranchisement of the Maori people by white settlers uh, that occurred through the 19th century. The sea and water are very symbolic, very resonant in this film in a variety of ways. So at times the beach and the ocean provide a sharp contrast to the inland, the bush. So you've got this bright beach and open sea, uh, sort of the other of the gloomy, tangly bush. So Campion is a, a symbolic filmmaker. She pauses for a long time on, on an image that she wants us to really see and then see again. So the startling image of Ada passionately playing her piano on the beach invites us to think about her, her pent up potential power and her power to become free. Whereas long scenes of her falling over in the muddy bush in this kind of crazy huge Victorian dress she wears seem to symbolize the way in which she and the island and the Maori people are all similarly oppressed by white men. And this contrast is very powerful, but it also signifies one aspect of the film uh, that has troubled many critics. So do we admire this film as a story of feminist empowerment that reaches across cultures and offers a true post-colonial version of New Zealand by giving us a story in which uh, women and landscapes and 
first inhabitants are all seen uh, as almost symbols of one another in being oppressed by imperialism, by a colonial incursion, um, by the insensitivity um, of, of the British and of a white British male uh, attitude towards uh, landscape. Or are we troubled by this? Um, you know, there is this sense that the film very much focuses on the story of Ada, on her oppression and her liberation. Uh, so some critics have been very troubled by this and have sort of dismissed this film uh, for representing the Maori people as, as kind of merely a background to a story about the entrapment and freedom of a white woman. Uh, so there's, you know, continuing critical debate about the political entailment of this film. Um, this is not the only controversial aspect of this film um, and it's not the only way that Campion uses water to create ambivalence. <clears throat> so Campion uses a, a very strong filter when shooting this film and in an interview she explains that this is because she wants it to look as though everything was happening underwater, as though the whole island of New Zealand and the action of the plot were happening under the sea. So you sort of get these long shots in the film where you're sort of looking up as though from the bottom of the sea, a very long trees that almost uh, look like seaweed. Um, so in Campion explains that she wanted this to symbolise the subconscious, the unconscious will of Ada, the heroine of this film. So the wateriness of the whole film sort of impresses on us this idea of a woman who doesn't quite know herself who's not quite revealed to herself, who hasn't quite surfaced um, as herself yet. Um, and quite famously at the end of the film, Ada almost deliberately drowns herself in the ocean, but she makes this great effort to bring herself up to the surface and to this kind of new idea of herself. So what can we do with this figure of a woman who is a mystery to herself? And how does this work itself out as a kind of gender politics in the film? Ada's affair with Baines, her lover, only begins when he buys the piano from Ada's husband so that Ada, very reluctantly, has to go to his house to play it. And Baines makes a deal, he makes a contract with Ada. She can have the piano back key by key if she would do certain things for him, certain things like take off her dress. So the evolution of this relationship is from one of direct coercion of a woman by a man to one of love. I mean, this is the centre of the film's drama. So do we admire this as a compelling story of awakening watery female sexuality, um, as a kind of compelling tale of female subconscious desire coming up to the surface? Or do we dismiss this as a story that presents coercive sexual abuse as though it is romantic? Um, and I think, you know, certainly uh, both those readings uh, can be very powerfully drawn out of this film. This is a very gothic film in its aesthetic, um, in the type of broody man it sets up as our hero. Um, and it's particularly gothic in the way that it makes this sort of queasy uh, uh, parallel between horror and liberation. Horror and liberation feel like the same thing in parts of this film uh, and particularly in relation to female sexuality. So it's a complex film in some ways, it's a politically troubling film but it's really fascinating and very thought provoking, provoking you know, the fact that it gets us to ask these questions about the relationship between one politics and another, between the politics of colonialism and the politics of gender liberation um, is a really exciting aspect of, of the film. So if you like novels by the Brontes, if you like historical fictions, if you like gothic atmospheres, if you like stories of fated romance and complex family dynamics, um, then I think you might enjoy uh, watching The Piano. Okay, so uh, the next, the third of my writers um, that I want to talk about um, is Yvonne Ariamba Urua and her novel The Dragonfly Sea. 
So this very recent novel draws on a personal as well as more general history of cross-cultural relationships between China and East Africa. Um, and it sort of more broadly engages with the, the energetic histories of cultural exchange across the Indian Ocean world. I mean, there are a number of things I, I really admire and uh, relish uh, about this book. I'm particularly interested in Indian Ocean literatures and the way in which the Indian Ocean uh, has been written about. Uh, so this book, in concentrating on this relationship between East Africa and, in fact, an island off the East African coast and China, really challenges what the Indian Ocean means, what, what that defined oceanic region, what are the limits, what defines this oceanic region? Is this a, a geological term? Is this a cultural term? Um, how expansive and how limited is it? It really raises questions about the way in which we approach the world and the way in which we tell history through these regional ideas, these regional concepts. Um, and it does this, you know, very lyrically and beautifully. This uh, novel really builds up, uh, accrues lots of different stories, um, which all, you know, gather around the central story um, of of a young girl becoming a woman. Um, but it, you know, it's got a big cast of characters, um, each of which offers a sort of feeling for what the Indian Ocean might be. Uh, but also traverses the world in ways that sort of expand um, and sort of blow apart, I suppose, some of our more fixed ideas of what regions uh, might mean. Um, this novel also really relishes language, uh, the sound of words and the movements between various different languages. So there's actually quite a strong sense in this novel that the Indian Ocean, more than anything, means a certain kind of confluence and exchange between languages. Uh, that's one idea of the Indian Ocean that arises from this beautiful book. Um, and there's something very watery, very fluid about the representation of language. And water is a symbol of our relationship to language and across languages. And then a third thing that um, I think is very thought-provoking and beautiful about this book is the way in which brings the story and feeling of a girl-woman's material relationship with the sea. So there are a lot of scenes and poetic moments where the feeling of being in the water, of being at sea, are uh, evoked, very carefully evoked. Um, but it brings this together with a big historical sweep of stories that cross oceans. So the way in which it brings the sea as an intimate material space together with the sea as full of big histories and, and complex histories, um, I think is, is very adeptly accomplished in this novel. So if you enjoy stories about growing up, coming of age, um, if you enjoy lyrical writing that plays with language and that plays across languages, um, and if you like writing about global connections between cultures, uh, then I think you will really love uh, reading The Dragonfly Sea. Okay, so my, my fourth writer is Christina Sharp um, and her book In the Wake on Blackness and Being. Uh, since it was published in 2016, um, this book um, has had a huge impact actually on, on a number of areas of scholarship and thinking. Um, and I'm going to just describe uh, some of the ways in which this book uh, operates. Um, it, it very hard to describe this uh, piece of writing, this book, in terms of a genre. It really blows apart genre in all sorts of ways. Sometimes it feels like autobiography. Sometimes it feels like a political manifesto. Sometimes it feels like literary criticism. Um, at other times it feels like high theory. Um, it's quite abstract. It moves in all sorts of different ways, um, in all sorts of different exciting ways. So is this a work of theory? 
Uh, one of the primary ways in which in the way on blackness and being works is through the etymology of the word wake. So Christina Sharp returns and returns again to the idea of the three ideas of wake. Wake as uh, the wake of a ship, the tracing left in the sea by a ship. Wake as in to become awake, to become alert, to become alive to something. And wake in the sense of a celebratory par party for the dead. And through moving across these three different meanings of the wake, uh, very poetically, sometimes autobiographically, sometimes quite um, cheekily, she uses uh, dictionary.com in, in a very sort of self-aware, uh, self fun way. So moving through and across the word wake, uh, Christina Sharp really um, gets her reader to think about in one way, then in another way, and then again, the lives of black women today, and particularly the lives of black women in America today. Um, and the book opens very powerfully, um, and in a way that makes you think that what you're about to bark on is, you know, perhaps a, a work of cultural criticism. So in the opening of uh, In the Wake, Christina Sharp offers uh, a criticism of um, a film, actually, that is usually much admired. Um, so Sekula's film, The Forgotten Space, is uh, very well known now as an um, important film about labour and the sea. Uh, so it's a much admired film. But Christina Sharp really picks up on the way in which Sekula does and does not present represent black women in this film and takes this film to task for the way in which it sort of uh, it invokes um, a certain figure of a black woman and then moves away from her uh, in a way that is quite dismissive. Uh, so it, it, it opens as a very powerful work of cultural criticism uh, that also is a, a very powerful political commentary on how uh, black women get represented in cultural, even, even the most um, apparently sensitive and, and, and politically alert uh, works of cultural production today. So at other times, this feels very much like political commentary, political manifesto. So Christine Sharp moves across lots of different histories, images, texts, um, to write about, to sort of give you this feeling that writing about the sea and in particular writing through this idea of the wake, the wake of the ship, women's lives, black women, women's lives are symbolised through the wake of the ship. To write about this is a form of political activism um, and that's a very powerful aspect of this book. Um, at other times uh, the book feels like a work of literary criticism. She offers beautiful thoughts on a lot of um, very sea-oriented, very oceanic writers, uh, Camille Braithwaite, Nobisay Philip, June Jordan, Derek Walcott. These are all, if you're interested in maritime poetry and poetry about the sea, uh, then these are all, you know, wonderful poets to engage with and that Christina Sharp quotes um, and analyses in various ways uh, across this very unusual, very exciting book. So if you, it's quite challenging to read, it, it's quite hard, hard because it, it moves um, sometimes in quite um, sharp turns between different ways and genres of writing. Um, but if you enjoy being challenged by writing, that sort of blows apart the whole idea of genre, of something being one thing or another. Um, if you enjoy sort of political poetry, um, if you want to find out more about the kind of work that's currently shaping the field of race studies and women's studies, um, then I think um, you would be interested to know more about In the Wake. I would encourage you uh, to have a look at it if, if these are things that interest you. Okay, so um, coming to my final uh, selected, it's very uh, selective uh, um, 
move uh, through women writing about the sea. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Elizabeth Bishop and particularly about her poem at the Fish Houses. Uh, so Elizabeth Bishop is a very important poet of the mid 20th century. She won the Pulitzer Prize. She was very involved in the poetic cultures of her day. Um, she's not only famous as a writer of the sea, uh, but her writing is full of salt water and coastal geographies. Um, so I'm going to read one of her best known poems at the fish houses. Although it is a cold evening down by one of the fish houses, an old man sits netting his net in the gloaming almost invisible. A dark purple brown and his shuttle worn and polished. The air smells so strong of codfish it makes one's nose run and one's eyes water. The five fish houses have steeply peaked roofs and narrow cleated gangplanks slant up to storerooms in the gables for the wheelbarrows to be pushed up and down on. All is silver, the heavy surface of the sea, swelling slowly as if considering spilling over, is opaque, but the silver of the benches, the lobster pots and masts scattered among the wild jagged rocks is of an apparent translucence, like the small old buildings with an emerald moss growing on their shoreward walls. The big fish tubs are completely lined with layers of beautiful herring scales, and the wheelbarrows are similarly plastered with creamy iridescent coats of mail with small iridescent flies crawling on them. Up on the little slope behind the houses, set in the sparse bright sprinkle of grass, is an ancient wooden capstan, cracked with two long bleached handles and some melancholy stains like dried blood, where the ironwork has rusted. The old man accepts a lucky strike. He was a friend of my grandfather. We talk of the decline in the population and of codfish and herring while he waits for a herring boat to come in. There are sequins on his vest and on his thumb. He has scraped the scales, the principal beauty, for an unnumbered fish with that old black old knife, the blade of which is almost worn away. Down at the water's edge, at the place where they haul up the boats, up the long ramp descending into the water, thin silver tree trunks are laid horizontally across the grey stones, down and down at intervals of four or five feet. Cold, dark, deep, and absolutely clear, element bearable to no mortal, to fish and to seals. One seal particularly, I have seen here evening after evening. He was curious about me, he was interested in music, like me, a believer in total immersion. So I used to sing him Baptist hymns. I also sang, A mighty fortress is our God. He stood up in the water and regarded me steadily, moving his head a little. Then he would disappear, then suddenly emerge, almost in the same spot, with a sort of shrug, as if it were against his better judgment. Cold, dark, deep, and absolutely clear. The clear, grey, icy water. Back, behind us. The dignified, tall firs begin, bluish, associating with their shadows. A million Christmas trees stand, waiting for Christmas. The water seems suspended above the rounded grey and blue-grey stones. I have seen it over and over. The same sea, the same, slightly, indifferently swinging above the stones. Icily free above the stones, above the stones and then the world. If you should dip your hand in, your wrist would ache immediately. Your bones would begin to ache and your hand would burn, as if the water a transmutation of fire that feeds on stones and burns with a dark grey flame. If you tasted it, it would first taste bitter, then briny, then surely burn your tongue. It is like what we imagine knowledge to be, dark, salt, clear, moving, utterly free, drawn from the cold, hard mouth of the world, derived from the rocky breasts, forever flowing and drawn, and since our knowledge is historical, flowing and flown. So the events of this poem are, are really, they're quite low key. They are in the first part about labour, then her, her observations of a, a daily seal, um, of the trees that grow up behind the port, so Bishop's poem evokes a maritime world um, as the site where the human and the non-human really meet in, a, in an everyday way, but also in a way that is notable, that has a certain intensity to it. Um, you know, it evokes this kind of uh, relationship between the net, the man, the animal. Uh, what I want to concentrate most on, though, are the wonderful last lines of 
the poem. And this idea we're given here that the feeling of the feeling, the taste, the coldness, the, the bitterness of the ocean is a metaphor for knowledge. Um, so we could read this from one perspective as a kind of anthropocentric understanding of the sea. Uh, so it's not like Rachel Carson, who's so good at getting us to forget our human perspective um, and to think in more ecological ways that aren't so human centered. Uh, we could uh, sort of think, well, this, is, isn't this poem sucking us right back into the idea that the sea is just a metaphor uh, for human experience? Um, on the other hand, I think we can read this as a really beautiful negotiation between a material idea of the sea and a more abstract idea of the sea. Um, and by moving between this idea of materially what the sea feels and tastes like and then this um, move towards offering it as a constitution of what we might imagine knowledge to be, you have this wonderful kind of negotiation between a material and a metaphoric um, ocean. So in maritime uh, scholarship today, uh, across disciplines, uh, there's a lot of um, emphasis on getting away from the abstracted ocean, getting away from the ocean as a metaphor for human experience and concentrating more fully um, on the ocean. But I think this piece of uh, this poem uh, by uh, Elizabeth Bishop, this wonderful um, piece of writing about the sea by, by a woman, uh, really helps us to think about the way in which actually a metaphoric and abstracted and a material ocean aren't necessarily opposite things. You know, the reason that the ocean is such a powerful uh, metaphor, such a powerful symbol in the works across the women writers I've speak, spoken about today is precisely because it is so uh, materially um, exciting um, to encounter as a scene and as something that we immerse ourselves in. Um, uh, the feeling of the sea um, is such a powerful thing, uh, a way of thinking about uh, the meaning of human life um, in so many ways. So if you've listened to this talk, it might be because you're interested in stories about the sea, um, in stories that are set at sea. So it's very possible that you've read lots of tales of men having epic journeys between islands, of men suffering shipwrecks, of men battling with whales. Um, and you know, a one, this is all wonderful literature um, that I, I read a lot myself. Um, but I thought I might sort of gather together um, one of the uh, effects of concentrating our attention more on uh, women writers and the sea um, by turning to uh, some works about feminism in geography. Uh, so Gillian Rose in her um, very powerful book, book on feminism and geography writes about the, the ways, all, all the very subtle ways that we mightn't even be aware of um, that white bourgeois heterosexual masculinity have structured the way in which we know, in which we operate within space, place and landscape. Um, and I think women writing about the sea um, can, is one powerful way of exceeding um, and getting past some of these um, assumptions. So we can turn to women writing about the sea to find a new relationship uh, with geography in all, in all sorts of ways. Um, and then I just thought I would pull out this quote from um, Astrida Nimianis's um, Bodies of Water book, uh, where she's a good example of something, uh, a way of writing um, that I think is gaining in popularity today, which is, um, you know, thinking uh, in very material ways about how, uh, how much our body is constituted by salt water um, and the relationship uh, between the ocean and ourselves um, in the Omanis' terms as a small ocean swallowed, a wild wetland in our gut, um, watery room to watery world, we are bodies of water. Um, again, this is a very poetic book, it's a book of theory, um, but it's also quite sort of 
lyrical um, in the way in which it's expressed. So I hope that today's talk has conveyed um, just a few of the very many and various ways in which the sea has been imaginative inspiration to women and how women writing about the sea um, continue to challenge us as well as give us a sort of subtler relationship to our um, sense of being in the world. Um, so I'm ending here with a, a slide um, uh, of pictures that my uh, daughters put together, uh, really just, to, I suppose, to symbolise future generations of women, uh, girls becoming women who will continue to imagine themselves and their world uh, through a relationship to the sea. Um, thank you very much for listening. Hi, my name is Mia. I'm the acting program lead at A Space Arts. I'd like to thank you for watching this video and if you can spare a few pennies for GHT, please follow the link in the description below to donate to our PayPal account. The money you donate will help support the organisation through this difficult time and allow us to continue developing content like this to keep us all entertained at home. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking here and hitting subscribe and you can watch more quality content from GHT by clicking here. Thanks again everybody and stay safe.